screaming at the moment, but don't worry. All right, you're live. All right, we are live for the third really big class for violinists. And we'll give a couple minutes before we start playing and, and getting to the music for people to sign on and get on the YouTube live stream. Um, just a little bit about today, just when I thought I had all the technical wrinkles sorted out and, and dealt with and that today would just be a breeze, today we are dealing with sync problems. So apologies in advance if those of you on the Zoom meeting um, find the videos that we're gonna screen share to be vastly out of sync. Um, some people are having problems, some people aren't. So apologies for that. We tried to sort it out and ran out of time. Um, about the really big class. Um, obviously this is, this is uh, come into being because we are suddenly all at home with time on our hands trying to find a way to be productive and relevant and inspired and involved with each other as musicians. Um, the idea first came out, it's actually something I've wanted to do for a really long time, and I apologize to those of you who have been on the past classes, you've heard this story already. But when I was a kid, um, I grew up in a small, smallish town in the mountains in the Western United States, and my mom put together a Saturday morning masterclass series for young musicians. And she just did this because she thought we all needed more opportunities to play. And the memories of those masterclasses are some really of, of my most treasured memories as a young violinist. I got to play for amazing musicians who I never would have come across otherwise. Um, then when I was in university at conservatory, my violin teacher had a weekly class. It happened to be on Thursdays in the afternoon. and. Um, those classes were just an absolute uh, feast for the ears because people would come in and play Isai Balad, or I remember hearing the Kreutzer Sonata for the first time in, in one of those classes. And, you know, your jaw would be on the floor as a freshman trying to figure out how people were playing this stuff. And uh, again, some of the most inspiring moments of my university time were in those classes. So I'd wanted to put together a, a masterclass series, but never had opportunities. So I, I found that here in Zoom and with this network of people that I've met across a long uh, time performing and, and playing with different people. So that's the really big class. Um, we just have a couple rules. It's pretty simple. Those of us on Zoom, it's easiest if you keep your audio and video off unless you're playing, um, obviously. And we have a little bit of control on that on, on our end. So don't be offended if your video disappears or you, you get muted. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end. So please use the raise hand feature to ask questions and maybe a little bit between performers as well. Um, what else did I wanna say? That's all about just the, the procedure of the class. Um, Helena, Helena Wood, I wanted to tell you a little bit about her. Um, I met her at a gig and uh, one of the real delights of being a freelancer, especially when you're new to a town like I am to London, is that you never know what the gig is really going to be like. You don't know who you'll be sitting with. Even if you know what the music is, you might not have played it before. In my case, I've never played it before. Um, and it can really, you know, your experience really depends on who the people are. And I showed up at a gig, random gig at St. Martin's and sat down. And it was one of those where a string quartet is doing the job of a much larger band. And that can be a little bit stressy. Mm -hmm. And um, Helena was leading. And I think I was probably the only second violinist, maybe. <laughs> and it was just easy and beautiful. And she had this this sort of grace and, and ease with leading the group that just brought it together. And I'll, it was fantastic. And I've stayed in touch with her actually on Facebook primarily. We've, we've bumped into each other a few other times. But uh, the amazing thing about Facebook is that you learn things like she has this amazing whippet named Joey. 
And once I saw that she had a whippet named Joey and that she was training this dog to do all the things that I train my dogs to do, I was like, yeah, she's good. We got to keep her around. So I hope Joey had a good day and a good walk in a field somewhere. Um, my dogs did not get walked. They are cooped up in unhappy, but it'll happen tomorrow. Oh. So that's Helena. This class today is, again, completely different from last week. Today we're looking at orchestral excerpts. And I was so thrilled when she said that that was kind of what she wanted to do because I was going to ask, but I was, you know, hoping that that would be an offer and it was. Um, orchestral excerpts are certainly not my specialty. I've had to start learning them. My students are learning them. And uh, it's just great that you're going to share your expertise with us. Um, I think we'll just go straight into this. Um, we're going to start with Will. And Helena, which which video should we share with Will? Um, why don't we start with the Schumann, if that's OK with Will? And so we can watch the video and then maybe just talk about a few little corners. And then we could do the Prokofiev if we have time after that. How does that sound? That sounds good. And Will is a um, recent graduate of the RNCM. He's out making his way in the freelance world. He's supposed to be touring and doing side-by-sides and amazing things, but he's in his father's shed. <laughs> All right. Video. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what's happened to Sorry, the video. One, one second, Cecily. It's um, it is a technical problem on my end. About technical ten, problem. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. It's so tricky, isn't it? It's really, really difficult. I've had some, but I had I only had to perform it once in an audition, and it was I didn't spend nearly enough time on it. It was years and years ago, and I just was slightly traumatized. So I've only <laughs> very recently come back to it and decided I'm going to get it. I'm going to. So I've spent the last week going yeah. over it and trying to really break it down. But yeah, I thought I'd what 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 better what a better reason to bring it to a master class like this to kind of find out the best way to practice it and do things. Well, like it does quite often come up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've actually, weirdly, I'm glad you're doing this because I've decided during this lockdown that whenever I practice, which is kind of every couple of days or something, I warm up with this. Oh, really? Oh, no. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, so, it's so tricky. And they often ask it, and they don't just ask it when you're going for Tutti auditions. They might do if you're going for principal jobs as well. Um, I've had it in concert master auditions as well. So it's a, because it is so tricky. Um, so I think it's quite a good warm up exercise if you're bored of Sebchik or whatever. Um, so that's what I've been doing. Um, so I think, could you just play for me up to uh, the first time bar? Yeah. And then stop there. Yeah, sure. Am I all in shot so you can see? See everything. Great. Right. <laughs> 
Fantastic. Now that time it was a much better stroke. Yeah. Then on the recording. Getting into the stroke is kind of one of the most it's tricky, right? Actually, yeah. And it's really hard to get it um, to start from nowhere. Mm. Really hard. I think the thing um, that I notice is that your that make sure that your bow hold isn't actually too flexible. Okay. Yeah. Because if it's too flexible, it's actually quite hard to control. Mm. Um, I actually have very little flexibility in my fingers when I'm playing an excerpt like this. Yeah. Because I think it's and also to make make sure that there's no tension at all in the right yeah. arm, so it's completely neutral, uh -huh. and that the fingers actually every single finger is holding the bow. Yeah. So it's not too flexible because the more flexible, actually, the less control you're going to have. Uh -huh. Yeah. Maybe just play a couple of bars, thinking of just thinking of that. Yeah. Sure. It felt, it kind of felt a bit easier actually. It makes it much easier actually. And yeah. especially think about the first finger, that it's not too relaxed like, I'm not sure if you can see it, like that. It yeah, actually needs to make sure it's round the bow a little bit. Am I kind of flopping it off a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it's, it's quite often that we just sit the first finger on and actually, mm. if you actually hold the bow a little bit in a passage like this, you'll have more control. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, when you're when you're um, studying growing up as a child, you're told everything has to be very free and flexible, and that's lovely. But when you come to something like this, it actually makes it much harder. Yes. Um, so if you have that little bit of, it, it's actually quite firm. You should you should struggle to take the finger off the bow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that already already that when you played it that time compared to the recording was a really good stroke. That okay. Um, the only other thing I think in this first section, could you play me? I'm just trying to remember which bit. Can you play this bit from there, whichever bar that is, the up, upbeat to bar nine? Yeah. Just, just up to the first time bar again. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going to be really picky. Yes, no, go do it, please. <laughs> um. I'm not, I no, wasn't convinced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's something to do with like trying to keep my fingers low. They like flap over and it's always a bit sharp, the E flat. It's keeping the hand in, in the same position. So as you say, there's, there's very little movement okay. actually. Yeah. That it stays as close to the strings as possible. Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons this is also given this excerpt. It's not just the stroke. It's the accuracy of the intonation. Yeah. And the things that are tricky are... And checking them. Checking them with your open strings. Those are the things that, if I'm sitting on a panel and hearing this played, if it's approximate, it sounds brutal, but it will usually be a uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> because someone else will come in and play it Perfect. bang on in tune. And I don't mind if you slip. If you do a shift and you don't hit it, that's not a problem. But if generally the intonation is a little vague, yeah. you just don't want that in a section of 14 people playing this. Yeah, of course. Because it, it, it just takes away that clarity. Do you know yes. what I mean? Yeah, so that's yeah, yeah. the type of thing that excerpts have to be, is you can make the odd slip, that's really not a problem. And I think that's something that a lot of people worry about. Oh, no, I made a mistake. Really doesn't yeah. matter. We're all human. But it's when, the, but it needs to be consistent. Yes. So the intonation of things like that <laughs> has to be right in the middle. Yeah. Every single note right in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's worth looking at. Yeah. Um, just those little corners. Um, and perhaps you could go from the repeated F sharps and then we can do the this next bit because that's tricky, yeah. isn't it? 
Yeah, this is the worst bit, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. Sorry, I should have said. Um, I have tried so many different fingerings for this. So, so yeah, same. And I, this is so still many. not that great. <laughs> so, well, but yeah, do you have any tips? Well, for a long time, I did exactly what you're doing. And I went, sorry, I'm, I keep peering because I've got the smallest iPad with the music on it. Um, so I'm doing... Uh, is that what you're doing? Yes, yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I was doing that for a long time, and then I decided last week that it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's not clean enough. It doesn't matter what bow stroke I use, where I play in the bow, how in tune it is, it's not clean enough. So yeah. I've tuned my bow, my fingering, and I mean, every fingering is individual. You know, everyone's hands are different, so it may completely not work for you. But what I've tried recently is so you just stay in first position yeah well, half position so that's half position and then i would go up to first position to a two which isn't ideal but you, you've got enough of a string cross to jump yeah. from a three to a two and i find it actually quite a lot cleaner yeah, 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 yeah. And you, the stroke sounds sounds a lot better. It's something about the high G string. Yeah. It just, it, yeah, it's always sounded a bit dodge. So. And I just think as well, the thing you've got to think about is what would it sound like with 14, 12, 14, 16 violinists? And I think that one is going to sound like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with that many people. Whereas I think if you've got if you do it across the string and the first position, it's going to be cleaner and yes. quite near the bridge. Yeah. So it's something to think about anyway, just to yeah, try sure. different fingerings. Because it is the worst bit, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons they give it. Yes, it's yeah, yeah. How <laughs> you could go with it. Um, but otherwise, it was, it's a really, really good stroke. I think the only other thing was things like this bit. Do you have letters, letter or bar 35? Uh, yes, yeah. Things like that, that bit. Those intervals again. Yes, yeah, I, I shift down onto that C and I always find I you hear the shift quite a lot. Do you stay in position? Yeah. Name me what you do. Ah. So I go ah. from a one on the E flat to a two, which is a bit weird. I do that. I think. Ah, oh, okay. I just go down to first position there. On the e, on the A. Yeah. And then I stay up, obviously. Yeah, I think I'm just being lazy and trying to keep the same hand shape like this <laughs> every time. I yes. tried slowing down this video of Chamber Orchestra of Europe doing it to try and like zoom in on their fingerings, <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of works a little bit. It kind of yeah. almost worked, but yeah, it's. I should definitely just try and make that like cleaner and yeah, more clarity. I, more. I think the thing is with the shifting when you're at this speed. Yeah. Is actually not to shift your left hand too early, because if you shift your left hand before the bow, you'll hear it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. If you shift your left hand at exactly the same time that you play your right bow, then you'll be. So I think in passages like this, it's always think hands together when you're shifting. There yeah. are other times when you'll need to shift left hand first, but yeah. in this one, I think hands at the same time makes it cleaner. And especially when you have to jump on that one, because yes, you don't yeah. want to hear. <laughs> it's never going to be good. And that's the one which is shift at the same time. Yeah. You won't hear it. That's kind of, I think, I think that's, that helps a little bit. Yeah. Um, so Cecily, do we have time to do the other one or should we? Yeah. Okay. So shall we hear 
the recording of your Prokofiev. Yes. <laughs> Great. playing it's really lovely now this is another one that's kind of like why are they asking it it's a funny one isn't it i think it has to be very pure and very neat and clean but i think actually musicality is something that they're probably going to be wanting to hear how you play this musically and i think a lot of people will go into the into the audition and they'll play this very accurately yeah and they'll forget that actually it's an incredibly beautiful piece of music. Yeah. And when you've heard, I remember when I was at English National Opera, we had a tutti job going there and we had 250 applicants. And so we cut that down to 60 auditions. And hearing something like that 60 times, <laughs> you, need, you need to make it you. Yeah. Um, um, and I think when you're playing something like this, it was very in tune and it was very rhythmic. And I just, it could well be Zoom and computers that I'm losing it a little bit, but I think it's the beauty that I need. Really. Yeah. That kind of, um, that delicate vibrato that you have in this kind of, because although it's quite classical, it is still Prokofiev. So I think if yeah. it's too white, there's something slightly missing. Mm -hmm. So maybe just try um, the first one, two, five bars and just think about your vibrato and the exact sound that you want to create. Yeah. Sorry, it makes a lot of difference. Now there's one note uh, that nobody ever does any vibrato on. And that's bar three, <laughs> the last note of the bar. Oh yeah. And the, so it goes. Which is such a shame. makes all the difference yeah I mean, the way I would practice it because you've obviously got all the notes and everything in the right place is I would practice this as musically as you possibly can with absolutely no vibrato yeah which is kind of weird but um and then add the vibrato because then you're really aware of how much you're using, how wide it is, how narrow it is, and yeah. exactly which notes you need it on. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you get these white notes, usually a first finger or possibly a fourth finger, and then you get these with quite a lot. Yeah. Ones that are quite comfortable to play, then they get a lot of drop, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, And I think this passage, Every single one needs a tiny bit. Because if yeah. you have none, that might be okay in a section. That's probably preferable. But in an audition, that just sounds bland. Yeah. So it needs to have that little, just a little shimmer. Um, 
I don't know what Finbar do. Um, um, but yeah, just that tiny little shimmer of vibrato on every single note. Yes, yeah. So yeah, the yeah. phrase has such a long line that it can't possibly die. Mm -hmm. I think that's in something like this. I think that's what panels are looking for. They yeah. want to. They want to be able to sit back and go, oh, that's just glorious. Yeah. And, and hear the sunshine and hear those long lines. Because we're going to hear lots of people playing it very well, mm. accurately. Do, do you? That's one of the things I wanted to ask at the end of the Q and A, but I'll just quickly ask it now. So, when when you're sitting on the panel, like where, do, as the auditionee, do you need to kind of choose your moments to be like, yes, I can be that player that's really contributing to this section, but just play, playing everything really well, but also like have have that something else that is like, yeah, we want to play with them. We, they would be a good team member to have sort of thing it's, it's really like the Schumann I think it's very much like play it right that's yep. great yeah tick well done you can play that stroke exactly. it's in tune and then this sort of thing it's like I would like when I when I recorded this I was like just just get it right that was kind of what my main thought yes. but like if I was going to play this on my own obviously I'd play it really it's like so differently so it's like finding that Finding that different mentality for each place, different orchestras will look for different things and different panel members, it's just... They will, and I think there's something to remember always with auditions is that you will never, ever, ever be able to please everybody. Yeah, of course. So it doesn't matter if you go in and you play like the most incredible violinists that have ever set foot on this planet. Not everyone's going to like it. <laughs> so it does, so at the end of the day, you might still come away and go, no, you didn't get the job or no, you didn't get the trial, despite the fact that you have played magically because it's not to someone's taste. Yeah. But what I would say is that learn the excerpts to the absolute accuracy that you possibly can and then add the magic, add the music and the magic on top of that. But practice that as well. Don't just practice it all accurately because yeah. then when you get into the audition, you probably nerves will get in the way and creating music becomes harder. So yeah. I'd say make sure that you're practicing the mu practice everything accurately, then practice with all the music on top, and then perform it to as many people as you possibly can to make yourself nervous. Yeah. <laughs> and then go and do the audition, and you've got to be you. You have to show your musicality, absolutely. I mean, the only thing I wouldn't do is pull around tempi and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can, yeah. Concertos do what you like. That's what the concerto is for, to show yourself off your individuality. Excerpts, you do have to be pretty controlled, but you can st I still want, I still think now of certain people I've heard doing auditions and they were very rarely the most accurate. They're usually the most musical. And I'll come away going, oh, I really want to work with that person. I want that person in my section. You know, that, that, that would be so exciting to have a musician like that. Yeah, so, that's really reassuring. <laughs> definitely. Definitely, yeah. those are the things that are exciting. Um, so to be honest, you've got it all there. It's just a little icing. Yeah, I can definitely add that for sure. Yeah, yeah. And keep it slow, slow cooking. <laughs> I'll start with your Schumann too. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna need it. And you'll be great. Thank you so much for playing. Uh, thank you so much for the advice and yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Cecily. And thanks everyone, thanks. Fantastic. Well played. That's amazing advice. And, and a couple things that you just said really um, hit me. One was play it to as many people as you can. And I think this evening or afternoon, whatever it is, morning for some of us, um, it's a really great example of that because the four people playing are at really at different stages of your careers. And still, like the need to come back and play these things for as many people as you can, well, it never goes away. You just no. doing that over and over. And then the other thing you said, which I would maybe put slightly differently, but I think I'm saying the same thing, is that you have to be happy with how you're representing yourself yeah. to a panel or to an audience or to, to anyone. You have to have that sort of feeling of, of how you're representing yourself and, and feel good about that. And if people don't like it, you know, so not everyone's going to like it. Yeah. But, so well played. Absolutely. I think we are going to move on to Lin Kuo, uh, who has a couple of, of opera excerpts for us, actually. Different, different fields, same genre. Um, Lin 
approached me, I think, on Facebook and asked if she could play. And it turns out we were chatting this afternoon. We know tons of people in common, yeah. which isn't that surprising because it's the music world is teeny tiny. Yeah. But um, it just goes to show how um, building your network, how important it is, because you never know when you're going to run across people and in what capacity and how you can help each other and 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 be a part of each other's uh, musical world. So that's pretty cool. Um, Lynn is from Canada. She's in Newfoundland. She's, uh, I believe, plays with the ballet. Is that what you wrote to me? I don't have my paper in front of me. Yeah, that's right. National Ballet of Canada in Toronto. Yep. Absolutely. And is preparing for an audition and wanted to, to do this today. Mark, um, you've got videos queued up. Helena, what would you like to hear first? Um, should we start with the Mozart? Is that okay, Lynn? Sure. Right. Uh, you're playing a video or am I playing it live? We'll, we'll play the video okay. to stay consistent. Thank you. I love this piece. It's so exciting. You can't help but smile. Um, I, I swear I did not lengthen that last D. And both times it sounded so long. Oh, really? Mm. It sounded like I played a whole quarter or a half note, but I I, I swear I don't do that long on the video. <laughs> I, so, so I swear I don't do that. It's probably the reverberation on the recording. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> It's really superb playing. I mean, it's it's so clean. I, it's so impressive. There's, you there's know, very... I would love to ask you actually. Um, yeah. I it's I I did so many takes of that. You have no idea. I feel I like in an audition when I'm nervous, I feel like my left hand is not even, and it's just barely even. Okay. I've practiced it separate bows, and I've practiced it in different bowing combinations, like <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Things like that. Do you have any tips for me? I wonder if it's too much tension that I'm holding. Like, this is. I was going to say how much. The problem in an audition is quite a lot of the time you get very little warm up time, right? Exactly. You get about ten minutes or fifteen minutes or something, which, to be quite honest, is not enough time to really warm up the muscles. Because what I suspect is that the muscle here, your thumb muscle, yes, is too tense. Yeah, that makes sense. The reason I think that is because I have exactly the same thing okay. when I do a performance. So I, if I'm playing a concerto or something, I'll, I'll get real fatty and then your fingers aren't falling naturally and they're not falling evenly. And I think it's because that muscle is too tense. So if there's a way of warming up that muscle, um, probably, you know those, have you seen those Chinese balls that you, when you oh. put in your hands and you twist them yeah i think it's quite a good way of warming up your hands before you actually practice i see um because i mean it's fine if you've got 45 minutes to warm up because then your muscles are warm and then less chance of having that uneven feeling but i think if you haven't got the time try and warm your hands up before you pick up the fiddle so mobilizing the thumb I think that's probably because, yes, the evenness is a real thing, isn't it? If you're cold, I also think one of the, psychologically, if you think of your hand in one position 
and you think of, I wonder if I move my hand that way, that might make it simpler to see. And you drop the fingers onto the fingerboard, as opposed to hitting them down or putting them down, you literally have your hand in one position and you drop the fingers. I think it makes it easier to control them and a lot more relaxed. So your hand stays in exactly the same position, no matter where you're shifting, and you just drop the fingers down. Are you, do you mean to say the shape of the shape yeah. of the hand? Shape of the fingers? Okay. Exactly. So the shape of your hand. Okay. Are you on the G string now? Yeah. Yeah, I do that in first position. I. I... Hmm. Oh, I never thought of third position. I tell you what I find really difficult is four three four three. Yeah, me too. Because no matter how strong your fourth finger, it's never strong and as strong as your two and one, which is why I do it here. Because it's it's gonna be stronger there than there, because that is really hard to do a fourth finger. And then now this one is not in tune, I feel. Yeah. yeah, I know that four and three is not even, I can hear it. So I think, it's hard to see on a computer, but I think you have probably quite long fingers, am I right? Not... Really? I think I have a very short fourth finger. So what I'm seeing when you're playing is your hand, when you're playing on the G string, which is what most people do, is you bring your elbow quite far round in order to reach the fourth finger. So when you do that, if your elbow is quite far this way, you're very on top of the string and you have actually much less control. Less control? Yeah, you have less control. So if you move the elbow back to a gravity completely right in the middle, not that far under and not that way, just right in the middle and you drop your fingers down. So you're actually less on top. Your fingers are slightly flatter. I see. You'll have much more control. Ah, you see, as soon as you put the bow on the string, you moved your elbow. Did um, I? Oh, yeah. okay. There you go. Oh, it feels weird. I feel like I can't reach my fourth finger. I, I bet you will be able to. I think it does. And I think also the other thing that we often don't think about is the exact note that we're going to cross strings on. Okay. Okay. So in this new, I'm using new fingering, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Now play it in the first position like you did before. Ah, uh, you see, I lose a few of the notes. Really? Yeah. I feel like this one, that one's e uneven. Are you crossing? Hang on. I think you're crossing strings a semi, a <laughs> quaver too early which is why you're losing that fourth finger. In the third position? Yeah. If you already start crossing the string, you lose it. Then cross. Mm. Yes. Perfect. Okay, now completely and utterly forget about the technique and think all the way to the end of that phrase. Am I at a good angle? <laughs> okay. No, you're great. Oh, wrong thing, Grace, sorry. Fantastic. But I'm finding that you're ending the phrase after the first two bars. 
and it's actually one long and especially as every member pretty much every member of the orchestra is playing it yes okay and always the best person to listen to is the bassoon because okay. bassoonists play this so beautifully and i for some reason so you just follow the line of the bassoon and they always play this lovely long line okay um Oh, wrong fingering then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in your own time, the other thing to do, which is a bit of a, um, it's a strange practice thing, but I get a duster. You know what I mean? Like a cloth. A cloth? Or something. And you put it on the end of your violin, and you put the end of your violin against the wall. So then I'll show you. So I get a little cloth like this and I put that against a wall. I'll use a music stand. Like that. Uh, there we go. Okay. And then you play it. Because what's happening is when you're trying to be musical, you're moving. Okay. And when you physically move, your bow has to find your violin. I'm exaggerating, of course, but right. if, if you move to be musical, it makes it technically much, much harder. Got it. Okay. So if you keep your scroll exactly in one place and then have all the musicality, but without moving, mm. that'll make it physically a lot easier to play. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's already much, much smoother. Okay. I wonder whether it might work a little bit higher in the bow. Because the you don't really want to hear the bow changes too much. Yes, because it needs to it needs to kind of whisper a little bit like this. Because if it's actually too clean, um, if you have that many people in an orchestra playing it really clean, it's actually just too present. Oh, this needs to whisper. Because then the next entry that you did, which is was absolutely superb, <coughs> then you really have the power at that point. The difference needs to be vast. Because this is, I mean, this is the beginning. This is the first thing that anybody in the audience hears. Mm -hmm. The chances are the audience is still talking and ignoring yeah. musicians. But that's the bit that you have to make everybody sit up. Yeah. Right, shut up and listen to us now. That kind of. I have a question. Did you think that I didn't vibrate uh, enough on that octave D? I'm wondering, because I sometimes don't like, I don't in enjoy the sound that I get. So I wonder if that was too bald of a sound. Do I need to vibrate more? That's my question. I don't think... No. Okay. Because too many people doing too wide a vibrato on an octave, not good. Yeah. I think if I think within a section, I think it's it's good to have a nice, narrow, okay. subtle, especially okay. Mozart. I get very self-conscious about my sound because especially when I do an audition or I'm nervous, my sound gets skinnier and I don't like it. I always envy people with round vibratos, round sounds, so that's why I ask. Well, I think to be honest with Mozart, you're probably onto a winner then, because you don't want too wide a vibrato or too rich a sound. You want it to be clean and delicate and sometimes like at that point, powerful. But I think it's probably you're, you're erring on the right side. Okay. I would, I would say with the vibrato especially in an orchestral setting okay um now i'm just trying to think uh can you just play the do you have bar numbers uh yep yeah. 96 yep yeah. would you just play that phrase up to the f natural I'm feeling like you're backing away before you get to the F sharp. Okay. Yeah, I think I hear that too. And that F sharp needs a little bit of love. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. So if you play it without the, the E, so you just stop in the F sharp. So that's the one that we're going towards. because it's quite often when we play a phrase like that we don't notice the tone quality of the most important note the, F sharp? Not the last one do you see what i mean so add the e now but always listen for the f sharp <laughs> and now do it um, without moving. Oh. <laughs> so much more beautiful. <laughs> it feels very unnatural, I'm sure, but it's actually it very unnatural. I'm a mover for sure. Okay, I will, I will, um, we all are. My, my body. <laughs> we all are. So, Cecily, do we have time to look at the other? excerpt oh. yeah we absolutely do we have plenty of time fantastic so shall we hear the verdi that then has recorded someone play an excerpt and give them a trial. Yeah. The intonation is really superb and it's got, it's very rhythmic. The only, only thing that I would suggest is the character. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the forte could be a little bit more playful. And then when you get the fortissimo, it could be much more dramatic. Uh -huh. And you have to think opera. Very operatic. Imagine that you're a singer and you are very over the top. <laughs> okay. Um, this one, this excerpt scares me because of the bow. I feel like the mix of slur, separate slur, separate slur, is it, and then doing it off the string, it freaks me out a little bit. So I'll try my best. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. You never know. <laughs> finding that it feels it feels very shaky <laughs> now have you which different ways have you practiced it well this is brand new to me so i only started learning it i don't know a week or two ago so i i try to practice it like i, I started off with a preliminary kreutzer eight warm-up yeah. because this feels the same but then kreutzer is quite light and this one is so if I play it that way, I can execute it light, but it says forte. So then I start trying to play it on the string, but then I can't really play it. 
And then I do trying to feel the string crossings with open string. Uh, yeah, and I try to do it that way. Um, That's excellent. That way I do as well quite a lot, the open string. Yeah, I, I rely on that quite a bit. I think what the way that I would, I would look at that and say, right, it's a sea of quavers. So I can be quite methodical about how I practice this. And I would practice, first of all, I would do it all slurred. All slurred. All loops. To two a slur. Two or four? Yeah. Say again. And it's throwing how many notes? In one four note. notes. Four? So, okay. yeah. And, that as, as well and as I mean, as the opening? whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So four notes. And I would do it and then try and do it up to speed. So with a metronome, doing four notes to a bow. The next one I would do is two notes to a bow. And the same thing, trying to do it up speed. And then I would do, you've got, you've got two sets, I would do the opposite of what it is. So yes, two yeah. separate two slurs. So, oh, my brain hurts. Um, no, other way around. <laughs> That way. Yes, that makes sense too, yeah. So do it completely the opposite. Um, and then I think I would also do the one where you slur the middle two quavers. <laughs> and see if you can do it up to speed. And then I would do the entire thing starting on the wrong bow. Ah. Starting on an up bow. And by the time you've done that, when you come to do it straight, it will be so easy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so actually, I'm just like to all if you, I'm sorry. If you warm up like that as well, just before an audition, you make yourself play it the hardest way possible. When you then come to the audition, it's so easy. Are you saying before, right before you step out into the audition room, or in your practice process? Maybe, maybe like that morning or something. You know. Oh really? Okay. Practice it upside down. Okay. Do you do that so the for you in there, it's so easy. Do, do you do that for even let's say Schumann Scherzo? Backwards? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, that one I've definitely practiced every bowing in the entire world. Backwards, wow. Okay. Everything backwards, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Yeah. Okay. Every single one. And then all backwards, upside down, inside out. Uh, three and one. Because also it's very good for your right arm string crossing. Because if you are doing all those different, your right arm has to know which string it's on in order for it to be clean. And if you notice you're skitting over any notes, then you have to go back and do it slower and work out why your right arm is not on the right string. And I think that definitely helps with things like this. And, and especially things like Mozart 39 and things oh, like that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So then when you're doing that, you're doing all the different bowings and your arm knows exactly, even if the only difference is like a centimeter, yeah. which string it's on. Yes, that's true. It makes a huge difference. So I think that's the only thing that I would but but I mean if you've only just been looking at that, you've got no problems. It's <laughs> fantastic. Is it yeah. too slow? Is the, I don't know this opera. Is it no. Just, it's not too slow, okay. Because I, that's the other thing I would do is play along to a lot of different recordings. Now that's another question I have because in an audition, I'm sorry, on recordings, tempos are usually quite fast because you have a, a cushion of an entire section. But yeah. when you play it in an audition room, it sounds frantic. So I, I was studying with Nathan Cole and I kept playing a bunch of excerpts, Mozart 39, Schumann Scherzo, Don Juan, and he, said, and he kept telling me to play it much slower than I would actually prepare. So oh, really? Well, an audition room, that's why I'm thinking, is, is this tempo too slow? Because this, I know I'm playing it at about 116 and recording goes, Berlin uh, filled with Claudio Abado is at 133. And yeah. Like it's Speedy Gonzalez fast. I don't think it would sound good in an audition room. The way that I would, what I would be aware of is that every orchestra is different and you may get, it's not unheard of to get someone on the panel asking you to play it faster. Okay. Or asking you to play it slower. 
So you do have to have the control and the ability to know that you can do both. Yeah. So the way I've been practicing recently, my my downfall is always that I practice everything very slowly and very accurately. And then when I come to play everything faster, I don't practice it up to speed enough. So recently in my lockdown, my new practice regime is to practice everything too fast, but it still has to be absolutely spot on. So I'm practicing Schumann two way over the tempo marking that I've got. So that when I then bring it back, it might not be perfect when it's too fast, but when I then bring it back, it's much more controlled and it's less of a shock. Okay. I wonder too, if, if I practice it too fast in the audition room, it will be 10% faster, which would be off the charts too fast. <laughs> it depends on the individual. Yeah, some people yeah. do play faster when they're nervous. Yeah. That you do have to bear that in mind, yeah. And I think that a lot of that that you have to do is just before you go in is the breathing, is thinking about your breath and your breathing and making sure that you can keep your heart rate as low as possible yeah you know that sport where they have to do skiing and then they have to lie on the floor and shoot oh gosh uh, have you ever seen that i think well they actually have to learn how to drop their heart rates so this they ski they do these ski jumps it's completely ridiculous and then they have to throw themselves on the floor and shoot a target and they have to learn how to lower their heart rate so that they can do it accurately and I think I, it's the same. We have to learn how to lower our heart rates before yeah. we go in. I, I spent 10 hours of coaching with Dr. Don Green. Um, yeah, so we did a lot of work. It's hard in an audition room. Like, the best I can do in an audition room is take it down that much. That, yeah. and, that's, and I asked him about that, and he said, yep, that's all you can do. If your heart is pounding, if you get to pound just a tad yeah. slower, then you already won, I guess. Exactly. So I don't take beta blockers in in auditions. I, I debate about that, but I I've been told not to. I've been advised not to, and I so I don't. So it's yeah. it's a, it's very individual whether people need take them or not. But I think it's um, yeah trying to. You're right. If you can just bring it the heart rate down that little bit. Mm -hmm. Also, you don't want to completely lose it because at the end of the day, that's adrenaline and that's performance. Yeah. And we want you to be performing in an audition and also if you've got any type of human panel they will also know that nerves play a part and it's not in the slightest bit natural to be doing an orchestral audition mm. there's nothing natural about it whatsoever no nope. let's play that little bit of don juan on my own because i'm <laughs> stand on a concert platform and do that aren't i it's so weird uh, yeah it makes no sense um so hopefully you'll have a panel who are human and empathetic but yeah, I think practice everything slowly, fast as well. But as you say, when you if you tend to be quite nervous, bring that speed down a little bit when you go into the audition if you can. Yeah. Okay. So you would go past the ideal tempo as well. Yeah. Yeah. Just so that you know when you bring it back, you've got complete control. Okay. That's true. Okay. But don't practice it too slowly that it's out of context, right? Yeah. Exactly. I think, unfortunately, we need to move on. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Lynn. Thank you so much, Jessalyn. Sounds Lynn. so beautiful, Lynn, and good luck. I hope that the audition doesn't get canceled and that it goes yeah. forward. And that it oh, goes good point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Um, And I just, I really loved what you're saying about practicing all these different ways. My students who are on the, this uh, meeting here, they'll all be chuckling to themselves because I'm constantly saying, do it a different way, do it a different way. What other way can you think of doing it? Yeah. And I've never done those particular bowing patterns. So I, you can be sure that that'll be happening in my next practice. <laughs> but as many ways as you can think of to, to challenge the brain yeah. um, so that the hands can just do their thing. It's great. Um, I believe it is eight o'clock, which for those of us in the UK is the clapping hour. So if you want to go out on your porches and clap, do so. I'm just going to clap like this um, and and be symbolic here. Um, oh, I, I like it. I hope your neighborhoods are, are going wild. Last week, ours set off fireworks, but I, wow. don't think, I know it's a little nuts. It's That's light out, though, so I think they will tonight. Um, <laughs> Next up, we have one of my students at the Royal Northern College of Music, Karis Saik-Sud. Um, 
she is in the middle of a module called, is it called professional development? Is that right? Are you there? Yeah. Are you unmuted? Yes. <laughs> I can't hear you. Yes, she's there. Great. And um, this course is supposed to be uh, giving a taste of what preparing for orchestral auditions might be like. And they were given this absolutely nasty booklet of excerpts to learn. Um, and she's chosen two of them today. One is uh, the opening of Ein Heldenleben, mm -hmm. and the other is the, uh, was it the first movement of Prokofiev Classical Symphony or the last? First. First. So what would you like to hear first? Um, let's start with the Prokofiev, shall we? Brilliant. Okay. this piece yes it's, it's so much fun to play have you ever played it in the orchestra no unfortunately not <laughs> oh it's so fun when you do get to it's i mean it's it's so difficult technically but it's so much fun to play yeah. um so uh would you like to just play the first one two three four five bars Lovely, really musical. It's absolutely lovely. Um, now, the only suggestions I would have, um, bar two, with this crescendo, I would go, I would play slightly closer to the heel. Okay. Um, so you've got... And then if you can end up somewhere here. Okay. Because if you're here, it's very hard to control, yeah? And maybe give a little bit of an accent on the because if you notice very if you notice the D doesn't have the double. Yeah. So maybe a little accent on the D. Okay. So were you doing a down bow on the top? I can't remember. I should have been doing it up. I think I Okay. I've got a down bow written in front of me, which makes zero sense. So it must just be the addition I'm looking at. Um, yeah, so perhaps just try literally the first two bars and just try the double notes a little bit lower in the bow. Okay. Okay, yes, it makes sense. You get a little bit more control, right? Yeah. So I have a little bit of the zoom... Um, delay. Delay thing. Yeah. So it's a little bit odd watching you because I suddenly realised that you were at the heel, but just not at the same time as what I was hearing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that, yeah. 
that bit needs to still be loud as well. And then, if you can do the first two with very little bow. So. And then you get, maybe just try it a little bit slower. And then the next thing I would think about is just the exact. I would, if, when I'm practicing that kind of thing, I put in the notes in between. Yeah. Just for intonation's sake, do you know what I mean? So that you've got a really um, solid arpeggio. Okay. Yeah. That, but then when you did your recording, it was, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the intonation's really good. Um, do you want to try the, try the next phrase from the um, fives? That bit. Great, that's really beautiful. Um, the only thing I would make sure is that I'm sure you've practiced this with a metronome um, because it's very tempting to do the first two bars I'm exaggerating obviously um, and then because it's a nice tune but it has to be absolutely metronomic that's the thing about this classical symphony there's there's very little space for rubato which is why it's so tricky, yeah. technically as well, to jump, because he jumps from different style, different characters so quickly within literally beats, but you have to do it absolutely within. So make sure there's... And things like the lines on the B and the F sharp, make sure that those notes are exactly a crotchet long. that one and that one because those are the type of things that the panel will look at this is why they give this one you want to know the exact note lengths yes and exact dynamics okay um maybe try from letter a i haven't got letters i've got numbers is that oh sorry um that's the next big chord yeah. that one two notes I would do those short and remember you've got a line on the E yes with a crescendo so when I would practice this excerpt I would probably do it with a metronome all under tempo with every single artic articulation yeah. so that you don't miss any of them so you're kind of the speed I would do things like that last note really needs love and care it doesn't want to be louder than the others but also it doesn't need to be forgotten yes okay little things like that um and then short those you would usually yeah okay um so maybe play the same phrase and then carry on say is it's very musical but again you sometimes losing tempo a little so even though you have the diminuendo it needs to stay exactly within the pulse um 
Now it's tricky because I can't, I can hear you so beautifully, but I can't see where you're playing things on the phone. But this sounds very lovely and clean. But I would make sure the last note needs to be beautiful, but not longer. Yes. Okay. Just try that for me, because it's, it's a tricky one. And now do it without moving physically. Yeah. Oh, so much easier. <laughs> Isn't it so much simpler when we don't move? And I know I, I you know, I'm my worst enemy. I, I do the same thing. But this is a classic one of those pieces that you just need to be absolutely rock solid. Yes. Um, and don't, yeah, yeah, don't move. And the tricky thing is in an audition as well, you're kind of expected to stand up to play your excerpts. When you be you're never going to stand up in an orchestra, are you? Well, possibly if it's a chamber orchestra, you might. Yeah. But most of the time you're going to be sitting which is much easier to be kind of solid, don't move unnecessarily, you know. Um, whereas when you stand, it's much more soloistic feel to it. Yes. So it's trying to get the balance right. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I have to say between you and me, I, I sit down for my excerpts in auditions. Right. It's not usual and most people don't, but mm. I'm never gonna play an orchestral anything standing up. So I play my solos and then I say, I'll be sitting down now for the excerpts. Okay. And nobody's ever told me <laughs> that that's not acceptable. Um, because if I'm doing an audition and I have to play things like all the huge solos in Held and Label, and I'm, I will always be playing those sitting down. So that's, but you do what's comfortable, but it's just bear, bear in mind, it's worth thinking about how much you move. If you were sitting down, yeah. Yeah. And then when you're when you're then performing standing up, you have to be able to create the same kind of um, stability, I suppose is the word, so that your technique isn't rocked. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 it's. I try to practice standing up and sitting down. Okay. Um, so that you've got best of both worlds. <laughs> you get used to doing both. Um, let's jump to the funny grace note bit. My favourite bit. <laughs> Great. So I'm hearing in the second bar, when you jump from the E, top E down to the bottom E, mm -hmm. I'm hearing you avoiding the open A string. Okay. So there's a gap. So what I'm hearing is. Okay. Do you see what I mean? There's a slight tap, dum, dum. And I think if you do the string crossing quick enough without moving, you won't hit the A string. You'd be amazed without moving how quickly your right arm can do a string crossing and not hit the other ones. Okay. Just try it. Now, I can't tell because of the video, but what bowing are you doing in this section? Um, so, two up, ups on... Uh those two yeah down on the grace note but up on the downbeat and then down on that second beat and then the same after that okay because i'm just trying to think um now it's individual and also every orchestra will do different bowings but the way I do it, and I find it easiest to be clean, is to go down, up, down, and then up, down, up, and then as it comes, basically. I find the shift on and up 
some reason, trying to do it on a down feels backwards. Yes. Okay. Um, um, and trying to do two bows is is too um, fussy or something. Um, I find that just just try it. I mean, it's an individual thing, but. Is easier. Yeah. <laughs> That's if the... something feels tricky, change it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm always the same with bowings as well. You know, it's like uh, I mean with fingerings when when it's like this just doesn't work. It doesn't work. I've played this piece for years. We'll change it. <laughs> there's usually there's usually you know there's usually a solution to every issue. I think. Yeah. So I think that one is slightly simpler. Yeah. And then you're here already. <laughs> Now it can be played either way. Okay, good, okay. So you can either play it on the string. Or. But that has to be very controlled. Okay. Um, but either either way is kind of acceptable, I think. Good. Um, I think with this excerpt, it, it's light and color needs to really come out, which you're doing really well. <laughs> the, the dynamics and the color changes because it's so sparkly yeah the piece of music is so sparkly and the one thing I always do with excerpts when I'm preparing for an audition is to have lots of recordings on a kind of playlist hmm. so that because quite often if you're playing excerpts over and over again all you're hearing is your part yeah and your technique and your little issues with that bar and that note and that shift and you forget the whole music and you forget all the other instruments that are playing. And quite often, if I then put a recording on and play along, I'm like, oh my God, this is so exciting. This music is brilliant. Yeah. And it's so easy to forget that. Yeah. Um, and this especially, this is the most brilliant, exciting music to play. Yes. So make sure once you've done all your little fin finicky practice and everything that you play along or you listen. Yeah. You remember the excitement of how amazing the music is. <laughs> so shall we ha hear have we got time to hear a bit of the Heldenleben Cecily yeah we do um the the video she sent and the excerpt that she has is it's a what full two pages of it um okay. do you want us to stop it or do you want to hear the whole thing I think it's what about three minutes why don't we stop do you have the music in front of you we could stop at figure yep. five or something yeah that's fine um let me just make sure so I know the first page because it is a long excerpt isn't yeah, it yeah and i think the second page is is more of the same so yeah exactly um yeah so we'll just play the first um page of that great This is another brilliant piece. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fantastic, isn't it? It's, it's really good playing. I mean, it's so, your intonation is really good. Brilliant. Which is fantastic. <laughs> um, the only thing I want to talk about really is sound. And again, as I was saying um, earlier, it might just be the Zoom quality, you know, and the recordings. 
the sounds getting lost. But I wonder if we could think a little bit about um, the kind of sound that Strauss would have been trying to create okay. compared to the sound of, say, the Prokofiev that we've just been doing. Yeah. Um, I think it's a completely different world. Yeah. Definitely. So you've got the kind of sparkly, light, explosive fireworks of Prokofiev. And then with this, you've just got this roaring, rich, thick powerhouse of sound. And that's what you've got to be able to create when you're playing excerpts in an audition, is the difference. Yeah. You need to be Jekyll and Hyde. So <laughs> if they ask you those two next to each other, they need to be completely different players, totally different. And I think it's a lot of it is in the vibrato. Yes, okay. So would you try the first up to figure one? Do you have figures? Yeah. So just the first few bars. And yeah. would you do it under tempo? And try and think of doing vibrato on every single note, including the semiquavers. So you'll feel ridiculous at the moment, <laughs> but it's just an experiment. Now, can you do a slightly wider vibrato? Okay. Okay, now, can you do the same width of vibrato a little bit faster? So what I think we need, it's really hard because unfortunately I can't see what your hand is doing. Okay. Is which that... is frustrating. So I can't, I can't um, really comment on how you're vibrating. I can only go on the sound. And what I'm wanting is a little bit more. There's a little bit more rotating, I think. I mean, I, I'm slightly guessing because of the video between these joints of the finger and that roll will create the thicker sound. Yeah. Um, it's easier, it's, fourth finger is the hard one to do it on. But if you're doing it, say on the second finger is the easiest. Yeah. And if your finger is rolling like this, when you're vibrating, you're getting the biggest bend in pitch. Yeah. Which, if you then speed it up, gives you a lovely thick sound. Okay. It's like the opposite of what you want in kind of Mozart. So Mozart, you want a nice narrow, so this knuckle is moving only a few millimeters. Yeah. And when you then do the Strauss one, and also does depend whether you're playing tutti or solo. Because if you're playing, you would, if you're doing solo, you can do that as much as you like. In a tutti, not so much, because then it's not <laughs> gonna be that in tune. Yeah. But this, I think you can have that kind of wider. Eve, I, it's really tricky because it's a fourth finger. There. That's the, can you imagine 14, 16 violinists making that sound? Yeah. I mean, you'd just be blown out of the concert hall, which is exactly the feeling you want. So just try that first phrase and all the way up to the top um, third line down. And just really think of that rich, fat sound and think of those joints really rolling okay. as you play your vibrato. really really great 
Now, the only other thing I think you need to add to that is the um, uh, bow control. Okay. So you don't ever want the release that you are looking for in things like Baroque music. Yes. You want the opposite. That note needs to keep going. And this one, keep going. So it's that three-dimensional sound. Don't ever give up. Yeah. Make sure every note has that pull. Yeah. And so that's got to do with where you're playing. Always a little bit closer to the bridge than you might naturally feel comfortable. Okay. And making sure that as you come to the tip, you use the weight, natural weight of your arm. Never pressing, because that's not natural, but just there, just gravity. And then you get that lovely fat sound, you know? Okay. So just try again that phrase and just think of extending each note as long as possible with the sound. fantastic it makes a huge difference when it just soars because he even has a crescendo on it yeah. he's like come on don't give up <laughs> you have to keep going but it's yeah it's it's so exciting when you can create that big fat sound isn't it yes and i think that excerpt i mean you've prepared it really really fantastically so it, it's all there technically it just needs that different color yes okay yeah Brilliant. but it's yeah fantastic playing thank you so much thank you <laughs> thank you very much that's very helpful. Exciting. So, Cecily, shall we go on to hear Alice? Yeah, we should hear Alice. And um, coincidentally, I met Alice in the same situation I met Helena. Oh, <laughs> in a really? random, gig, random gig at St. Martin's. She was oh, leading. Yeah. I was sitting next to her. We played some Mozart divertimenti together. We had a really good time. And... Um, so here she is uh, with cancelled auditions, sadly, but lots of excerpts at her fingertips. So, ah. so thank you for joining us and for agreeing to play. Uh, what should we start with? Uh, why don't we start with Brahms? Is that okay, Alice? Yeah, that's fine. And, right. and you're playing second violin excerpts, which... Um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, why be sorry? I think it's amazing. Um, I listened to your Brahms and I was like, wait a minute. What's yeah, <laughs> oh, I should probably said that. They are, yeah, they're both second line and excerpts. But yeah. um, obviously the Brahms, um, anything that applies to the second part is going to correlate directly to the, to the pr pretty much a lot of it up the octave. So uh, yeah. hopefully it's useful if you're not even learning the second part. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. this is the opening of uh, First Moon of Brahms 4.
Fantastic. Oh, it's really great playing. There's actually very little that I would <laughs> want to change. Um, it's one thing I really love is your, do you have letters or do you just have bar numbers? I've got letters, yeah, letters and bar numbers. So letter B towards the end of yep. the episode. Oh, you vibrate on every single note and I love it. <laughs> it's such <laughs> a good thing. It's so, it, but it makes that lovely fat brown sound, which is great. The only other thing, the only thing I would think about the whole thing, now obviously it's every orchestra will play it differently, but I wonder whether it could have slightly more drive. Yeah, I, funny enough, I recorded it a few days ago and uh, since then have recorded myself again, just pushing it forward, just, it, it felt uh, on listening back just a little bit too held back, especially around A, because um, I know that the woodwinds are kind of moving it on there anyway. So um, yeah, I would definitely yeah, agree with just that. that just having that kind of momentum yeah I think um now obviously you don't have to tell me who which orchestra it is but are you using a specific part for a specific audition um I am using uh yes their part funny enough I was going to mention it in this sort of thing afterwards that I have all my excerpts I mean what 10 years of excerpts basically in a folder and actually I do have the tendency that if when audition when um, excerpts come out I do get my parts out because they're often annotated with some really great things I do then cross-reference any uh obvious bowing um I think I've changed one bowing from what they gave me right okay just to, just to interject, I didn't actually share Alice's part with you, Helena. No, I just no, gave, no, I've just got a blank one. That's I gave you a clean one, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's just that I just, it's a really tricky one that I don't think there is ever any obvious answer as to whether it's okay to change bowings. Mm. Now, obviously, if you're going for a, it's a tricky one because if you're going for a concert master, do what you like. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you can tell everybody else what to do. But... Otherwise, I mean, I do, I would try to stick to theirs. But for me, I mean, this, the beginning of this excerpt is, I think people feel it different ways anyway, phrasing wise. But to me, it feels a little bit upside down. Okay. Um, because to me, if I was singing it, I'd be going, obviously, I can't sing, but. It naturally goes down and up and down. And so it feels a bit funny to do it instead of do you see what I mean that's it mean yeah yeah I mean it's it's an individual thing but... I mean that phrase is much more naturally I I think so and it just as soon as I saw you playing it I was like that's very beautiful but it feels wonky would you, know? you be brave enough to change the bearing for, for an audition why not I, I sort of, I wrote that when you were, I, I can't remember who I was talking, we were talking, who, I can't remember. Anyway, I wrote in the comments in our, in our chat, I was like, often I will change the bowing. Yeah. Um, and I've never been told, you know, can you do it exactly. again? I think it's okay, because quite often, I know from sitting on the panels that when you set the excerpt list, mm. quite often you set the excerpt list and you just send it to a librarian. And it sends exactly. it out. Yeah. And they could be using an old edition, they could be using the one you played last week, but it might not be. I mean, you just don't know. And so I think if they're really, really gonna be that picky, they may then say, actually, can you play the beginning the other way up? And you've got the technique to have no problem with that. But to me, it just felt yeah. slightly uncomfortable, <laughs> raising wise. Um, that's the only thing. And then the only other thing was the direction, the feeling of direction in this I one. Um, with that. And that's another small point. After letter A, when the woodwind had the tune, you've got this. That was beautiful. And the next one. Make sure that you don't ping on the top. It's still got that phrase going on. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. another one that if you have an entire section going. It will ping out across the orchestra. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so those are little things that you could probably look out for. Um, going into letter B, I think again a little bit of direction. 
it could it could have a slight sense of direction because something like Brahms is less rigid than say the Prokofiev classical. Yeah, a lot of the recordings I listen to do just push it, just it's it, yeah. talking about. Exactly. There's just that sense of and I think the thing is with excerpts, especially I didn't talk about this with Lynn, but especially with opera excerpts, if you're doing something like Bohem, if you were to learn it looking at the page, it makes absolutely zero sense to how it you actually play it in the orchestra because there are huge pauses where the singer's holding a random note and every singer in the entire universe does it, but nobody has ever written it down. And it's things like that that you kind of need to just know. Yeah. And that's also what they will be judging you on. Do you know that actually yeah. most conductors will move that bit forwards a little bit or most singers will hold that note really long so you're going to have to stretch that phrase mm -hmm. and things like that is definitely useful and when you're listening on the panel and you hear lots of people you'll know the ones that either have really listened to lots of recordings or those that have played in a lot yeah because <laughs> you can tell so i think it's worth uh, again listening to all the other parts playing along and making sure you get swept up in the music because all the technique and the sound is all there. You don't need to change anything there. So <laughs> it's fantastic. So maybe we should hear your other one. What is the other one? Oh, Bartok. Yeah. Oh, this piece is crazy. I find, yeah, I mean, I've played it in orchestras, but I, I, I find this excerpt a bit of a scary one. It's quite, it's tricky, isn't it? And it's, yeah. I mean, it's a completely crazy piece. Um, I do love this bit though, it's really fun. Yeah. So shall we listen to your recording? <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's nothing that needs kind of um, technically changing or anything. The only thing I would worry, I would consider is, is changing a little bit of the character. Um, I think, for example, most of the triplets, I would do them more off the string. Okay. So a little bit more um, playful. <laughs> the part I was given, um, yeah. written on Marcato. So, uh, so if you were doing it on Marcato, you could, but I would still do it probably upper half-ish, yeah. and I would do it still shorter. Um, so it seems like very hard work. Um, which is, I would more naturally play it like that. But if they have written on, then they can try the martelet kind of approach slightly shorter. Um, so, oh, I can't remember my bowing yet. but I would use more weight. So when I'm seeing you play, that's the kind of position or your wrist is a little bit higher. I would actually use a slightly more, just gravity yep. to create that thick sound. Yeah. Yeah. 
and maybe and probably quite close to the heel. I do it even that bit when the first violins come in and you drop back to mezzo forte. I would still have it here, even though you're playing it. You know, you drop the dynamic a little bit. You can still have that clarity. Yeah. I think looking that if your wrist is too high, actually it's quite hard to control and you're going to get a lighter sound. There's something about the upper arm here dropping a little bit that will give you a little bit more. It's not too much because if you sit like that, that's just uncomfortable. But it's just, if the wrist is too much like this, you'll actually have a more bitey sound. I've got written at the top of the page, uh, drop arm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much better, the sound. Now, the only thing is, I'm not entirely sure that your right hand knows exactly when the string crossings are. And so when you cross the string, you slightly lose the clarity that okay. you had when you were on one string. So when you cross the strings, make sure you know the exact angle that your right arm needs to be at. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, the only other thing, going backwards a little bit, the first, um, I think it needs to be a little bit shorter so that it has a bit more bite, those two bars. Um. <laughs> okay, so the is too slow. The think of those as cl close as they can be. I found it really hard. I didn't um, hang on, let me just think about this. So if you do it slowly. But that's still fast. And a kick, really from the string bite on the up bow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Almost think of the grace note being on the on the beat. Because you almost don't hear my top note, but it's an illusion that you can hear it. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're being really mean to yourself and you're doing it with doing your finger. Oh, yeah. What? What? Would you shift then? Yeah. So yeah. I'd do a third on that. Okay. And then what about the slide then when you go back? Um, what were you doing? What fingering were you uh, doing? I was, so I was doing four to straight straight away, four, and then yeah. swapping over to a two, three. Yeah. Because I find that a more comfortable thing. <laughs> yeah. Depends how brave you are if you can hit the F sharp on a two. Because <laughs> that's going to be probably fine, but when I get into an audition, probably not so fine. So, um... It is possible to get. Yeah, it's... if I practice it, I think. Because I think I did notice when you played it through that the was too slow. The okay. great note with a fourth finger is slightly too lazy. Yeah. Or, better. or, so I'd probably end up going three. And then on the second bar, I'd move to a two. 
Yeah, I do that, but moving from the four to a two. So yeah. I could do a combination of both. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I like that. I think it's yeah. a kind of creeping up thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. I never really thought about making life more easy for myself. <laughs> <laughs> work at getting it closer but but yeah I think that would yeah. definitely make a difference um yeah and the only other thing I would say in the whole exit because the, the stroke we've talked about is when you have the piano towards the end after 309 mm. I think that could be maybe a bit more of a different <laughs> a little bit more kind of bitey a little bit more sprightly and then you've got the difference as soon as you hit the air. Um... The mezzo forte has a bit more punch. Um... So, yeah, I tell you why, because I've been trying to do it with a sort of more flautando stroke there. And also, I think even though it's piano, play it closer to the bridge, you'll have much more control. Yeah. yeah yeah i think then you have more bite it's amazing how much when we play in orchestras we end up playing further and further and further towards the fingerboard <laughs> and then i used to go to my teacher in america and he'd be like where's your sound and i'd be like sorry it's in the orchestra pit i've left it there i've got no sound anymore and he'd be like Close to the bridge, close to the bridge. I have to like, spend <laughs> hours practicing like Ponticello, but it does, yeah, bring it, especially in an audition situation, bring everything a bit close to the bridge. Yeah. But yeah, it's superb. I mean, it's, it's so well prepared. Oh, thanks, yeah. Helena. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well played. Uh, so, Cecily, what happens now? What happens okay. now is we open the floor up to questions and we say a huge thank you to our performers for absolutely putting yourselves out there and playing these ex excerpts. It never feels good um, <laughs> to you and um, you've been really game and I hope you got a lot out of it. I know I did and I think everyone else did as well. So um, questions, we can take questions from uh, the Zoom room if you raise your hand if you see where that option is i'll i'll try to pay attention and also on youtube if you have questions put them in the chat and we can we can figure out if we can get them answered so any questions or comments i'm looking simon's there simon's got a question emily has a question yes i'll unmute emily hey emily hi um i was gonna ask um if you think there's a difference in um, how you should prepare excerpts for like um, an opera or a ballet compared to an orchestra. Um, how would I do it differently? To be honest, I would prepare them in, in exactly the same way. The only difference would be, as I was talking to Alice just now, about how opera does differ. In, in its use of rubato in a completely different way to symphonic music. And I think you have to pay much closer attention to that when you're doing opera excerpts because um, the amount of times people come in to do opera excerpts and they play it very straight. And then you realize that actually you can't play it like that because singers will play it completely, will be pulling it around in a completely different way. Um, so I think that's the only, only way that I would prepare them differently. To be honest, I think that yeah. Otherwise, I prepare them pretty much the same. Cool, great question. Anyone else? Yeah, Simon, let's get you unmuted. All right. Ah, I can't seem to do it. Oh no. Okay, I'm failing to unmute. I hit the button and it's not happening. I'll try it one more time. Can you put it in the chat and I'll ask the question? Sorry, that should work better. Um, okay, anyone else? 
No? You guys have quite an opportunity here. My whole class from RNCM is here. Oh, wow. Great. Ross, you've learned these excerpts that Karis played. Did you have any questions? You know I'll call on you if you don't ask questions. <laughs> mean teacher. <laughs> no, nice teacher. <laughs> Brendan, anything? Louisa? Oh, they're being shy. Well, Ross, yes, Ross. Excellent. Hand up. Unmute. I feel like Bye. I need to speak because you've said it. Um, yes. <laughs> um, you know how you were saying, like, change the bones, but don't change the bones. I feel like it's such a controversial conversation to have. Like, it is. How brave have you got to be? Like, if they like put them in red pen in your BBC and accept or accept or whatever, and you're like, I just don't agree with this at all. Do you do you even if it's in red pen, do you just ignore it? You know what? I think this. I don't actually think that there's a right answer, which is really annoying, right? Mm. If you want me to tell you a definitive answer, but I don't think there is one, and I think maybe it even shows something about the individual and their personality. Because if you really, as you say, feel really strongly about something and it doesn't fit with you musically or technically or whatever, and you decide to change it, that's saying something about you. And it says that you have individuality and you have confidence and you have something to say. Um, I don't really think that that's a bad thing. I think if you are able to do it both ways, that of course is an advantage because if they then say, actually, could you play it the way that we've written it, then you've got a bonus on your hands. I think if you decided not to change it, that also is stating something and it's not a negative. You're saying, see, look at me, I can do everything that you're asking me to. So I think it really is an individual thing. Um, I have done both. I have done auditions where I've completely changed everything. And as Alice was saying, I actually quite often, well, I always find my parts for the excerpts that I'm asked to do. Mm -hmm. And then I play from them. Okay. And if somebody specifically says, actually, can you play that in a different way, which they do in auditions, they, they may well ask you to play things differently. Then hopefully you have the flexibility to do it. Okay. So sorry, that's not a black and white answer, is it? <laughs> No, but it's a good one. So yeah. Yeah, Alice. Uh, I, I, hello. Um, hello, fellow RNCM students. I was there uh, quite some time ago, but um, uh, he hello. And well, I heard, I see that you studied with Julia. I also learned with Julia. So uh, hello. Um, well, I was just going to follow up with Helen, Helena. Um, I mean, so yeah, I've done a fair amount of auditions. Um, do, not pre do not be scared to just go and do as many as as you can, um, I've been doing them for quite some time. Um, I, I've only, I was just on the Boeing thing. I've never been um, asked to do something again with a different Boeing. I have been asked to do something for a different speed and perhaps playing something more in a Baroque style rather than a you know, vibrato taste, but never ever been asked, can you do that again for a Boeing? And if you want, uh, Helena maybe agree or not agree, but. I, Panels don't have much time and they're probably, in my experience, not going to pull you up on one or two Boeings, yeah. um, but maybe tempo. I have been asked to play things different tempo um, before. So that's that goes back to Helena saying playing stuff faster and slower, I think, is would is great advice. Yeah, cool. That's great advice. Yeah. Yeah, Louisa, let me get you. <clears throat> hey, um, I often find it hard going from one excerpt to the next like especially during an audition I wonder whether you have any tips like anyone um whether you write something at the top of the page just to remind you just before you play it or do you really think of the recording or like get to sing it in your head before or like all those things do you have anything else so the, the way that I do that is well there's a few ways the way I practice it um is once you've done all the background practice and you've got all the technique and everything's solid then put all the excerpts in a hat and put yourself in an audition situation pick them out play them you don't get a choice what order they're coming out so that's one way of doing it when you have no audience you know um so you have one shot at it as well you can't do the whole right i'm going to play it oh that wasn't quite good enough i'll do it again no no you have one go 
and then you pick the next up. So, and the other thing is to play it to as many people as possible and put yourself in a similar situation to the one you're going to be in. So even if it's just to your cat or your dog, you're still putting yourself in a position where you're performing and possibly getting a bit anxious or nervous. So pick some friends, doesn't matter whether they play the violin or the tuba or anything, make them sit there and fire excerpts at you. And it's, I was told by my teacher, do at least four playthroughs before an audition, at least. So four mock auditions, because then when you get to do the actual thing, it's not a shock and it's not scary. I mean, once you're actually in there, the only thing I would do is, yes, I would try, I would try and imagine that I'm in an orchestra and I've got the piece in my head. And then you just try and play the music and you forget about the technique and you forget about everything you've practiced and you are playing the music. It's all about performing, even though it's an audition. So little things will go wrong and that's totally fine, but you're performing music. That's all a panel wants to hear, I think. Thanks. Great, I think we're gonna uh, try to get Simon's question in here again. Give it a go. Hi Can Simon. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm very, very good, that was great. It's so, so <laughs> nice to sit and just listen for a change instead of having to dish out the, the, the advice. Um, uh, just a quick question, going back to Will at the very top. He was doing two exits, which would probably be uh, quite possibly for a symphony orchestra job and for a chamber orchestra job. Do you have any thoughts about whether you would uh, approach those slightly differently? Because I guess for me, um, uh, you know, with my experience of, of, of chamber orchestras as I have now, uh, I'm looking for somebody who really uh, can, can absolutely come with a personality and can contrib contribute. I'm not looking for a foot soldier. I'm looking for a, a you know, I'm looking for a, 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 a corporal, I guess, or a sergeant or whatever, you know. Yeah, I think I think it is a slightly different style of playing, isn't it, when you're doing chamber yeah. stuff, and you can possibly be a bit more mm. individual. I think, to be honest, if you're going to be, I would prepare exactly the same way. Yeah. Um, whether it's opera, symphony, chamber orchestra, whatever it is, I'd prepare in exactly the same way. I think if you're going for it, it's like going for a principal job. If you're going for a principal job, you can be more soloistic. You can mm. be more demonstrative in your leading and your entries. And that's probably what they're looking for. And I suppose with a chamber orchestra, you could possibly be a little bit more individual as well in the same yeah. way. Um, and yeah, possibly less so in a symphony orchestra because with the symphony, you do need someone to blend a bit more. I but you want that, as I said, you want you want somebody that you're looking for a, a particular piece of Lego. It could yeah. be blue, it could be red, it could be green. If you happen to be a green piece of Lego for today, <laughs> you're going to get a trial. You might get a chance. Um, if you're coming in, in and you're bright yellow. Yeah. Cool. Just think of it as a nice day out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think there is a slightly different approach to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the same way that there's a different approach to the different. Oh, sure seats that you might be going for yes i would agree absolutely having sat in some of those chairs uh, yeah. in, in, in my previous life uh, yeah i i would agree totally um have, yeah quite a few people coming to me wanting to step up to more principal jobs uh -huh. and it's really changing the sound mm. from tutti to solo sound and yes. also changing sometimes when they're playing and i'm like okay now you've got to leave me Mm, I'm yes. behind you and I need to see how you're going to bring yeah. me in the section. And you have to show that when you're going for principal seats. Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. So, yeah, I think there is a diff slightly different approach, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. But uh, uh, so for the four people who played, brilliant. If you're all yeah. still there, I can see Alice is still there. Um, uh, Kairos, I think, probably still there. But well done, everybody. That's It's, it's nerve-wracking. Yeah, Even right. when you're when you're on a screen and you're in your own house and you think, well, this is my safe space. This is where I practice. <laughs> Can't go, why should it be any harder? You know, but yeah, no, it, it, you know, know, it is challenging. And and technically speaking, um, I, I can let a cat out of the bag now. Um, I am a professional conductor. Is what I do now. Um, I am a, a chief a chief conductor of a state chamber orchestra in Slovakia. Former, uh, I conduct the Saint Petersburg Symphony, so I get to see the sharp end of what what, what you can produce when it gets there. Um, and it's just, so it's no different to playing just like you did now. If you can get that in your heads, you know, just, just come out there and, and, and be the people that you are, because that's what we, we all need. You as a, as, a, as a leader, 
and uh, you you want players that can that can that can join in and be part of your your section. I want a section of violins that that, that are all singing off the same hymn sheet, yeah. and you know, and 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 are prepared to 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 slot in behind a leader that they that they uh, that they respect and that they want to work for. That's that's how it works for me. So yeah, but brilliant, great class, really cool. Thank They've you, all been Seth. so different. They're great. Thanks, Cecily. Thank you very much. I think we've got a question from Alex. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed that class. It was very, very useful. Um, but my question is, I, I really struggle with short warm up times. And I was wondering if you have any tips on how to utilize them and like, how can you make the most of them? Because you don't want to just play through the excerpts over and over again because you just want to warm up and you're panicking yes. um so what i totally I yeah i totally agree with you and actually the last audition that i did i really struggled with that i think i had about 10 minutes warm up um and i had 50 pages of excerpts and two entire concertos and i was like how would you do that <laughs> and that 10 minutes also included the the warm up with the pianist i was like uh, okay that's not very realistic it's really tricky. The things that I do, um, I would try to physically be warmed up before. So even if I have an hour's travel, say, to the audition or whatever, I would try to be very warmed up at home or in the hotel room or wherever you are. Um, so that I would definitely do. And then another thing is to make sure that your hands are warm, you know, fingers, gloves or whatever. Um, all the little things that I'm sure we all have our own ways before performing, but eating a banana, drinking chamomile tea, all that stuff. Um, and I was talking to Lynn as well about using those Chinese balls to rotate your fingers to get them this suppleness going. I think anything like that can be quite helpful. Um, and when you get in there, I would actually warm up the way that you would warm up at home for five minutes. Say you have 10 minutes. I do that warm up for five minutes that you do at home so that you can feel comfortable and you can create your own space. And then I would take, I, before I got there that day, I would make sure that I've chosen a couple of excerpts to warm up with. So you choose one that you might think, I'm just going to double check those couple of bars. And then you choose the one that makes you feel the most confident and you feel most strong about, and then you warm up with that. So don't go, oh my God, I must practice that bar and that bar and that bar and that bar, because you've done all that. You've done all your preparation at home. So just stand there and go, right, you know what? I'm gonna play this excerpt because it makes me feel good and strong and confident. And then the one thing I do just before I go in, if it's possible, is to play the first phrase of the concerto you're gonna play a few times. Because that's the first thing you're going to do is walk in and say, hello, panel. Delighted to see you all. Can't think of any way I'd rather be right now. And then you're going to play your Mozart. So I would have that Mozart and the music flowing in your mind first. But yeah, it's a totally unnatural situation. And hopefully you would always have a panel who know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a very difficult situation that you're in under pressure. So. Yeah, I suppose it's just trying to find your own routine. Yes. But thanks very much. Yeah, that's helpful. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I just cut her off. Oh. <laughs> Finger slipped. Um, that's amazing advice as well. I, I just have to throw in a very small story. I had an audition last summer where I had made like all of the preparations I, I could to make it so that I, because it was important to me and like I was going to get there in advance and have a nice place to stay, all this stuff. My flight was canceled. I arrived 20 minutes before the audition and had to walk in and just play. So there's, there's something to, to just playing as well. Like just making yourself just, you know, come in from a ride. You probably come in from an epic ride and pick up the violin and, and play or, you know, whatever, um, whatever, yeah. just to, to have those situations. Yeah, Alice, let me grab this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think there's something uh, important about actually being able to just go in and, and play because I've had a similar, exactly the same thing. Um, train can well, sitting on a train for three hours um, and they moved me later and later and later until I was the last audition. 
I actually rang them. I said, I'm five minutes away. They held the panel back and I had no choice but to literally run out of a taxi. Um, I didn't even change my trainers. Like I just went in straight away and played and uh, it actually went really well, but it, you just don't know what will happen. I mean, obviously try and make sure you're as well prepared travel wise, but sometimes things will go out of control. Um, and you just sometimes have to just go in and do it. It's not ideal, but uh, yeah, it's funny how we've both had similar kind of, <laughs> Yeah, it, it happens basically. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it happens in the concert world too. I mean, yeah. what I've mostly done is is play concerts and and you know, well, back remember when we did that when we played concerts, <laughs> um, and sometimes you're just late and you have to play. So, yeah. oh, sad face. <laughs> um, I think we should probably wrap up unless anyone has any more burning questions. This has been amazing. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I'm just going to give my little plea here. Um, if you found this interesting and inspiring, um, oh, look at Mark, he's got my little, my, <laughs> my uh, I can just read this. Um, next week, we have another great class planned. Uh, we'll go back to, to regular repertoire. Um, Pasha Saburi is a, an old friend of mine, actually studied with me briefly. Um, I ha he has an amazing studio uh, of students in Austin, Texas, and we've got four performers lined up for that. Um, I've set up a PayPal, PayPal account um, to raise funds, if we can, to send to our guest teachers. Um, I hope you're all well and safe and doing what you can. I know it's not always easy to practice in this kind of situation. I'm finding it very difficult. Um, but hopefully things like this and whatever you're coming up with on your own are keeping you kind of going and and interested. So thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Helena. Thank you so much to all of the candidates. I mean, I was blown away. I have to say the courage it takes to, to perform like that is, yeah, hats off to all of you. I, I yeah. totally understand how hard and the performance standard was really quite superb. So thank you very much. All right, so we'll end the meeting and end the live stream and see you next week. Thank you, Cecily. Bye. Thank you.